Hey everyone, Mark Hayward here from the Absolute Business Mindset podcast and YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. We've got a great interview with Mark Hirschberg, who's a CTO, speaker, author, and MIT instructor. We're going to go into a varied and interesting conversation about business, technology, engineering, software development, and we'll go into areas which you might not necessarily expect beyond the CTO role, where we talk about the 1,000 hours rule, as well as diversity of work and business and the roles of doing a couple of different things just to keep interest and keep variety. So we're then going to go into talking about networking, negotiating as a leader. And then what is really interesting, towards the end of the interview, you've got something about productivity and how someone should be productive in their business and as a worker as well. So if you're enjoying the podcast and you're enjoying the YouTube, then please do give it a thumbs up. Please do give it a like. Please give it a subscribe and hit the bell icon. And then you'll get all of these podcasts ready for you. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Enjoy the show. This is the Absolute Business Mindset Podcast, created and hosted by Mark Hayward. This podcast will interview entrepreneurs, business owners, and people in their careers. We will delve into their journey to success, key life milestones, and go deep into their area of expertise. Get ready to learn from other successes and failures. Today, we have Mark Hirschberg, who is a CTO, speaker, author, and MIT instructor. Hello, Mark. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me on the show today. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. We've got a lot to cover. There's some really interesting parts of your experience and your expertise that we're going to go deep into. But as always, the podcast is called Absolute Business Mindset. What does business mindset mean to you? It means being focused on delivering value to your customers and supporting your coworkers and employees. I think those are dual pillars. Too many people focus just on the first, and that's critical, but we have to look internally as well as externally. I couldn't agree more. I think uh, if uh, I've, I've worked with people and I've, I've also um, read and, and they talk about if you, you should service your employees first, because they will then look after your clients. And I think it's a really important thing that some people miss and they think that all they've got to service is their clients. But if you've got a great team around you, they'll do that service for you as well. Exactly. We serve, we talk about servant leadership. We serve our employees Mm -hmm. because I as an individual cannot do everything my customers need when I have a big business. Yeah. So by working on letting my employees be effective and supporting them, we can then deliver value to the customer. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your, for your, what that means to you. Um, education wise, so you did uh, a degree in physics and then you did some education in engineering as well. What made you choose those subjects? I was interested in physics ever since I was about eight or nine years old. I heard my cousin take a physics class and he was talking about black holes and things that sounded really cool to me. So that's what got me into physics. I don't like doing just one thing. I got into computer science. I got into software when I was in ninth grade. I said, okay, I want to do both of these things. I was interested in politics too. So I also minored in political science. But when it came time to grad school, they do try to encourage you to stick to just one area. Grad school is a little more intense. So I focused on the computer science, specifically cryptography. And psychologically, why do you think you've, because you do multiple things now as a, a CTO, speaker, author, and MIT instructor. What do you think it was in your personality that wants to be involved in some diverse different things? Some of it is just natural curiosity. I have always wanted to keep learning and doing new things, trying new challenges. If I did the same thing day after day, month after month, it's going to get very repetitive. But then I found along the way, when you're in multiple fields at once, when you're doing multiple things, you can find new opportunities by combining lessons and knowledge from each one and finding new types of innovation. And what's, what, what, so, so, my mentor said to me, and I, I'm actually with you on this. I, I do a diverse different things as an entrepreneur, but my, uh, my mentor that I worked with for five or six years, he said, it was a Bruce Lee quote, which was actually, 
you need to not be scared of the person that can do a hundred kicks. It's the person that does one kick a hundred or a thousand times because that rep repetitive of one kick is a lot more impactful than learning lots of different skills. And I, 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 I'm actually someone who tries to focus very much on one thing and, and become an expert. So podcasts, I've been doing this for four years now, done 150, 180 interviews and, and I've got better at it. So it, it is, there, there, there is that need of repetition to be very, to be exceptional, to be very good at, at something. What's your thoughts on that whole idea of, of Bruce Lee's quote? When you think about that quote or the famous 10,000 hours, yeah. it depends on the skill set for certain tasks. So famously chess or sports, by putting in those 10,000 hours by just repetitive practice, you get very better in a very narrow range of activities. Yeah. But when you are doing different things, so I have a, a dance background, for example, I did competitive ballroom dancing and there was a lot of training. In fact, we used to joke our, our instructor would have us do, we called it a circle of death, where we just stand in a circle and do the basic step over and over and over for an hour. Right. Nothing else, nothing fancy. But they often encourage ballroom dancers as you get advanced to take some ballet, to take some tap, to take some other types of dancing, to incorporate something different, to take yourself out of just, I am mechanically good at this. So with podcasting, for example, Yes, certainly you are far better today than you were at podcast number three or even number 30. Mm -hmm. And you're in the zone in some sense. You have your way, you know how to do these podcasts, you're organized. But if you then go out and do, let's say, public speaking or teaching a class or other types of similar but different activities, yeah. you can come back and say, oh, you know, I just had this really crazy idea. Here's how I'm going to mix up this process somehow and make it different, add a different dimension. Might be better, might be worse, but you're gonna bring in, a little, <clears throat> bring in a little extra. The way I think of it, if you take iron, it's relatively weak. You sprinkle a little bit of carbon in there and you get very strong steel. Yeah, it's so true. It's really, really true because that diversity brings new thought processes and you can be innovative. Um, and so I, I totally agree. That's, that's one of the reasons why I do a diverse few different things because when you're doing something else you'll think oh so I do property I do real estate as well so when I'm doing something with real estate with marketing on finding properties whatever it is sometimes I'll think oh actually I could do something similar with my podcast or with or with another business so I think it is really really important to, to yes hone skills and develop skills in one area but that diversity brings new trails of thought, which can be quite innovative and quite different. Exactly. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Awesome. So your first role was after your uh, education was as a research staff at MIT. So you, 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 how, how did that come about and, and what exactly were you doing as a research staff? There was a professor for whom I had T8. I was a teaching assistant. Right. He was working on a new software language. And that sounded pretty interesting. And I honestly didn't know what I wanted to do at the time. I knew I didn't want to go to Wall Street. I didn't want to do big tech, which at the time was primarily Microsoft and IBM. Yeah. I didn't want to go into consulting. That was the other big area. Startups weren't a big thing back then. This was the mid nineties. There were some, you heard rumors, but it wasn't a big thing. So I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I thought, let me just hang out here. I can hide at MIT for another year. And this was certainly an interesting project. So that's how I, I first got involved. It did not turn out the way I had hoped. So what language was it? It was a language called curl that does not exist anymore. It's not the curl that some people use today. Okay. This was in the time that Java was coming out. And so we yeah. had this idea of a language that could combine HTML and JavaScript, and then a full language like Java or C++, all in one language, it could do everything. It was a good idea, just not well executed. Okay, fair enough. So, so a lot of your early career after MIT was as an engineer. Um, and, and actually, I heard this from lots of different sources that 
engineers that go into business, entrepreneurship, startups, and, and even into sort of business careers, they can be some of the hardest to teach, but once they get it, they really get it and they can be hugely successful within business. Was, was that your early experience of, 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 of being an engineer and moving into business? I would reframe that slightly. It's not that we're hard to teach because I do teach these business skills to engineers right. and I, I've got experience doing it. I think it's that at first we just have a view of the world that is usually a little left-brained and doesn't take into account some of these other things. We're very black and white. Right. And overcoming that mindset, that is the hard piece. Once that mindset shifts, once you unlock the door, that becomes very easy and we're quick to learn. Hmm. And so I, I think it's just getting that shift. And then we can apply our quantitative discipline to business problems and become very effective at them. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. The people that I've I've uh, I've worked so I I, I worked in Big Four for about fifteen years and uh, worked in their tech area, and the guys that embraced the business side and also coding as well accelerated their careers hugely quickly because they were able, as you say, they were able to tap into the sort of logic of coding with the logic of business. And 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 I wouldn't say less uh, emotional, but but made decisions on on rational, logical decisions rather than necessarily uh, decisions on emotions. So is that something? Because you actually you you are an instructor. We're jumping around a little bit, but you're an instructor at MIT now. How do you how do you find uh, teaching undergraduates, uh, engineering undergraduates in business? I love it. It is one of the favorite things of mine that I do. And it's exactly that issue. It's getting that mindset shift in the program we teach. I know you could spend multiple semesters teaching leadership, but we don't just teach leadership. We teach a bunch of things. We have a small amount of time. And so what I have to do is open that door, get them to see things in a different way that it's not just about you did the math right and got the right technical answer. It's how you convey that answer. It's how you get buy into the answer. It's how you frame the answer. And once they start to understand why that's important, and we have certain ways we teach that, then they say, oh, I get it. And you see the light bulb go on. I love that moment. And all of a sudden, as they go forward, they start to recognize opportunities to continue to develop. It does go both ways, by the way. I encourage all my engineers at work they need to understand the business we're in. They need to understand how does sales work? How does accounting work? But I encourage these other departments, learn how product works, learn how engineering works. The more you know about other parts of the organization, the more effective you can be. So, so in a, because of time, I was, was going to talk about your consultancy experience and, and how these couple of CTO roles that, you, you, that you've done. But I want to move to, to that CTO role. So you're a fractional CTO, which you instructed me, you told me earlier on was that you, you work for a couple of different businesses as CTO. What challenges do you find? Uh, you, you can give an example or, or trends that people um, experience when they're looking at their, their business and they need a CTO and, and how that person as, as a role operates within a business. It will vary a lot by the business. Sometimes it's a business that has some technology and over time technology has slowly crept in either different tools that they've bought off the shelf or things internally they've created, but because it wasn't planned out from a high level, it's like building a house one room at a time. And all of a sudden you look and say, I guess we technically have all these rooms, but boy, this is a mess. Mm -hmm. And you need someone to come in and, and tame it, if you'll forgive, maybe a mixed metaphor there. Mm -hmm. So that's a very common problem. Scaling up. Well, we've had an engineering department and they've done things, but all of a sudden, as we've grown, it's just, it's not working because what worked at one level didn't work at another and you weren't conscious of that. Or it's that we have a functioning business and we know technology can further enable it, but we just don't know how because we're not technologists. So I come in, I'm typically a CTPO, so Chief Technology and Product Officer, because for a lot of enterprise products, 
really the two go hand in hand. And I really think it's much more effective to run them together as one organization. I think that's really fascinating because uh, do you work for smaller companies, like startups, or do you work for more established companies or a mix? It's been a mix. I like the startups because it's always fun to do the green field, the new and exciting. And often I'm there early on before they bring in their own full-time CTO or CPO or, or dual. Yep. But I've helped some larger organizations, some Fortune 500s who wanted to play startup and say, we want to do this internal project and we need a technical person to be the CTO for this unit. Or in some cases, it's a large organization that just says, we have so much going on. We do have a CTO, but she's too busy to do everything. Can you be her proxy on this type of work and just run it for her and keep her apprised? Um, God, you could go lots of different angles on on that. Um, but let's let's just take one of the examples that you gave with um, companies that that want to scale. So let's just say they. They have a product or service that they they've built, and it might not necessarily be specifically engineering or, or but but they've got they've got their core product and they bring you in because they know that technology is a part of their future and how they build their business, and they want to grow exponentially. How do you approach that situation as a as a as a CTO or a proxy CTO to be able to scale a business? Yeah, great question. The thing to remember is that what works at one stage doesn't work at another. If I have five engineers, I can stick them all in a room and say, let's just coordinate. We don't need to have lots of meetings and documents flying around. We're in a room. We can say, hey, everyone, can we just circle up for a minute and talk? That works at five people. That doesn't work at 15 people. I need to be a little more formal. When you get to 50 people, what works at 15, that doesn't scale to 50. I can't even put them all in one meeting and have us all talk. Mm -hmm. So you get what I call inflection points where you have to change your process on one side versus another. Now that's an internal version. Think about getting a customer. Your first two, three customers, that's very messy and hands-on and you're figuring it out. That's different than how you get your next 20 customers. That's different than how you should be getting your next 200 because by customers 198, 199, it's no longer all hands on deck trying to figure this out, you should have a process in place. And so what happens is as we scale, we continually have to change how we operate to work to a different process. And all software does, it automates processes. So the mistake people make is they throw in the technology before they understand their process, and then they automate the wrong thing. So you really wanna get the process done right, and then you can implement that in technology. And, and for building businesses and building larger businesses, that whole is, that whole idea of systems and processes that you get core people and they might be particular grades, they might be particular experiences and getting them all in into a team or into multiple teams to be able to develop products or, um, or, or innovate in, a, in another area. That actual process. So just talk me through that building a process or system for a company. How would you approach that when you're dealing with a, a, a piece of software which you want to build? It goes into understanding your customers and your customers' customers. Now, some of those customers might be internal. This might be a tool that not only do our customers need it, but maybe our accountants need some technology as well because they need to check in and get some weekly type of report. Maybe some operations team needs to use it a certain way. So I wanna to talk to everyone touching this. And that means not only the head of the department says, oh yeah, yeah, we, we need this, but the people actually doing it at the keyboard using it to understand how they operate. I have a friend who runs a consulting business. He hires anthropologists, people with that background because he can send them into the customer and say, study them the way you've been trained and understand how do they operate. Hmm. That's what I try to do. How are you operating? What is the process of the accountant? Not just when she's sitting at the keyboard, but the process of how she's going to use that report generated to do something within our business or how our customers person using our software will use that to further their goals. So I really want to understand the big picture, not just we have to move this data from here to there. And once you understand the big picture today and where it might go in the future, you can start to architect and design a system 
to support the current process and be able to support future processes as well. So it's interesting you talked about a tech or a software architect. So I've just written that down now. One of the things that I experienced um, after working for the big four in tech for a while, they introduced a, a, a software or a tech architect. And actually he revolutionized is, is a bit of an extreme, but he really made accelerations into our different types of software and standardized some parts, bespoke other areas, but he would sit down with, with us. I was a business analyst, project manager, and I had tech um, software developers in, in the same room and we're talking. And he would, he would take that reflection point and sort of step, step away and say, Look, this is where it's all sitting. How do we actually want to make this process more efficient, more productive, better? What, what, what's your, like, have you, like, do you use, is there something that you do as a sort of tech architect to take that step back and reflect on where the business is? Absolutely. That's what either I do, or if it's a big enough team, I'll hire someone to do that for me and, and double check his work. Think of it again, to use a house analogy. First, if you're building a house, if you say, well, we're going to build a, a four room house. Oh, we're going to add on to it. It's going to be a five room house, a six room house. Fine, but when you're now coming up with a, an 80 room house, all of a sudden your foundation can't support 80 rooms. Yep. You didn't plan for it. But if you had an architect who said, okay, I get one day this will be 80, we have to lay that foundation first. Yep. Another thing that can happen when you're building these different rooms, if this particular room uses a different size window than the others, this room uses a different type of electricity, right? US versus uh, European standards. They say, oh, we have to adjust this room. Oh, no, wait, we have to get the US version electrician for this one. We can't use the European one because it's the wrong thing. It's done differently. Mm -hmm. An architect's going to say from the start, let's standardize. Let's have all our windows the same size. Yep. Or if there's an exception, we'll be very conscientious. We understand because that will be a cost. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's justified, but they're going to standardize. They're going to lay things out. So you've got that right foundation and allow you to move faster in the future. There's gonna be some upfront cost. You can't just start building day one, yeah. God draw the plans. But here's the key thing. When you think about designing a house, when you have the blueprints of your house, if you wanna move a wall, that's very easy. You take your eraser, you erase the line where the wall is, you write it somewhere else. There's no real cost. Once you've laid the foundation, well, if you wanna move the wall, maybe you have to adjust the foundation. Once you put the wall up, it's a little more expensive to move it. Once the plumbing and electricity is all in, okay, now you've, you've been committed. That's really costly. So an architect will help you think through the longer term decisions so you can make the right decision earlier because as you go further in the project, it's costlier to make a change. 100% agree, 100% agree. Okay, tell me about your book, The Career Toolkit. Uh, tell me about what you're, what you're trying to communicate as, as a toolkit. Early in my career, I knew I wanted to go from just being an engineer to being the CTO, the person overseeing these teams. And I realized that to do that, when you're leading and managing other people, whether it's as an executive or a founder, you need other skills. I can't just be a really good engineer. I need to understand leadership, team building, hiring, networking, negotiating, and no one ever taught me these skills. You don't learn them in high school or college. We hear about them but they don't teach it to us. So I had to develop the skills in myself and realize these skills are not just for the senior people up top. They help everyone. We're better off when the junior people on my team are also leaders, are also great at negotiating, at team building. So I wanted to upskill my team and MIT had gotten similar feedback from companies so wanted to put together a program. That led to my teaching at MIT's Career Success Accelerator and after doing that for 20 years, I wanted to reach a larger audience, hence the book, The Career Toolkit, where it covers 10 skills that we know companies say they want and how to effectively learn and employ these skills. And so when I was doing some research on the book, it said these critical skills of networking, negotiating, communicating, leading and career planning. So an area which is important to some of my listeners is networking. How would you, how did you teach it in your book about how to make 
all levels because I, th- I think you're absolutely right you some people just think it's the the executive board who need to learn how to negotiate how to communicate where in actual fact you need leaders all through the business when i worked in 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 big four the successful teams were where there was junior staff that were looking to understand how to negotiate how to network so so just tell, talk me through how do you help someone uh when it might not necessarily, they might not always see the benefit of networking, but the, the importance of networking is hugely important. It's usually easy to help people understand the benefit and, and networking is probably an easier one for them to understand because we've heard about it before and we get that a better network brings you more opportunities, whether that's a new job or an employee for your business or a partner, or customer, people get the benefit What they struggle with is how to do it because we have the wrong mindset. In each of the chapters in the book, it has a mindset shift and then specific actionable things you can do to get better. So networking, for example, people have the wrong idea about networking. They think, oh, I need a job. Time to go network. Hey, Mark, great to meet you. Listen, do you have a job? Here's my resume. Let me know if you have a job. That's like saying, hey, Mark, we've been hanging out in the pub tonight. Just met you. You seem like a nice guy. Really glad we hung out. So listen, this weekend, I got to pack up my flat. Why don't you come over, help me pack up, right? You don't, you don't mind doing that, <laughs> right? That's a huge imposition. Now, if we've known each other for 20 years, I can say, Mark, I need a favor. I, the mover's back down on me. Can you come over and help me out? And you'll say, sure, Mark. Yeah, happy to help you out. You've been a good friend to me. I can do that ask because we've had that relationship. So when people network and think, I have to network because I have a need, You're showing up, you're asking people to move you this weekend, people you just met. Instead, you want to build that relationship. Don't start with an ask, start with, I wanna get to know you. I wanna build a relationship. And once we've known each other for a while, then I can ask, can you help me out? Now we can do little bits of help. Passing along a resume isn't that hard. Okay, yeah, I'll just, I'll pass it to my manager. You can do that, but that's not as good as if I pass to my manager and say, this is my friend, Mark. He is fantastic. He is a super smart guy. He really understands the type of work that we do. You definitely need to interview him. That's much stronger than, hey, here's a resume some guy gave me. Yeah. And and do you know what I find as an entrepreneur that the, the, the syndrome that most people go to networking events is either collecting um, uh, business cards which you never really know who they were or what you spoke about, or, or now it's like making LinkedIn connections. And, and they think that a successful night is 10 cards or 10 LinkedIn connections, where actually if you spoke to two or three people and really went deep with them and found synergy and found connection with them, they're the people that you can do business with further down the line. So yeah, I, I, I it's, it's quite old school. I have actually done the card thing again. I got some more printed out because I just found that everyone was just connected on LinkedIn. You forget who you were speaking with. Actually, even the old fashioned card can be quite, quite powerful and quite impactful. So, um, right. I like the cards as well. You know, I, I always teach people saying someone you've add on LinkedIn is in your network. That's like saying someone who swiped right on you on a dating app is now your significant other. We would never think that, oh, look, she swiped right. We're in love. No, there's some interest, but now you have to build that relationship. In that case, it's dating. Okay, we've added ourselves on LinkedIn or exchanged cards, but now we have to build that relationship. It's not dating, but it's spending time getting to know each other, building that trust. That is networking. Absolutely. And the the other area I want to talk to you about is negotiating. So I'm I'm pretty late to the party, but I've recently read or listened to Chris Fossey's book on negotiating, Never Split the Difference. And it really, I don't know if it's, if it's a book you're familiar with, but it was a real game changer for me to think about. So it, primarily I was thinking about negotiating for property prices, like buying a pro- real estate uh, pricing and, and buying real estate. Um, how do you, how do you, how do you build people? Because ne- negotiating, networking, you kind of see out from an outside, you understand what you're trying to achieve. But negotiating is a lot more nuanced. There's a lot more involved in getting a good price or negotiating something. How do you, how do you help people, um, entrepreneurs and, and people in their careers with negotiating? Negotiating, let me give you an example of how important this is. Imagine you are an employee and you're 25 years old 
you have a job offer for $50,000. But instead of taking it, you negotiate, get $1,000 more, which is not a big lift. If you do nothing else, if you sit in that job for 40 years, you've just with one five minute negotiation got $1,000 more for 40 years. In five minutes, you just got yourself $40,000. But of course, you're going to have other jobs, other promotions. So if you learn to negotiate, you can add tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earning. Now, that's just about jobs. Of course, this applies to customers, to partners, to internal negotiations with our coworkers. Mm. And now at first, I hear some senior people say, wait, my employees are suddenly going to get tens of thousands of dollars more. I don't like this. But if you teach them to negotiate, maybe they all do get 1%, 2% more when they negotiate their bonus. But imagine if everything your company does got 1% or 2% better more from your suppliers, more from your customers, better outcomes when you negotiate, you're expanding the pie, making it so much more effective. Now, you mentioned Chris Voss's book. I list a number of books. I talk about negotiation. I cover how to do it in my book. I list some other ones on my website. I actually don't recommend his book. It's a fantastic read, but here's the thing. He does hostage negotiations. The essence of his book, never split the difference mm. because you can never say, okay, tell you what, you got six hostages, send out three, you keep the other, we'll call it a day. Now, if you're ever kidnapped or someone you love is kidnapped, call Chris. He is far <laughs> better than I am, but he deals with a very specific type of negotiation. That's what he's been trained on, which is very emotional, which is life or death, literally. His negotiations, you can't say to the bank robbers, listen, it's been a long day. Let's just, we'll all go to bed. We'll circle back tomorrow. The clock runs. The negotiations you and I do when you're buying property, when we're in a business deal, often it's by email. It might be we meet, we think about it, we come back. He talks a lot about the emotional side, and that very much applies to his it applies a little bit to ours, but there's a lot more techniques I think are more applicable that you'll get from other books, my book, Bargaining for Advantage. Um, i trying to remember some of the others I named. They're, they're all on the resources page on my, on my website. I'm blanking on the names at the moment. Okay. Good for I, you, uh, great for me is another. I will, I will look at that because it's something that I'm getting a little bit fascinated about that whole negotiations and, and, and how it can impact all parts of your life when you're negotiating with your children as well, which is sometimes really tough. They're probably the hardest clients I have, hardest customers I have. Um, so I will look at that and I advise my listeners and, and, and viewers to, to go and check out uh, your website to, to look at some of those, 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 those books. Um, thank you for that. Uh, what trends do you see in the future of work? I think work, we're going to see some, a little whiplash in the next couple of years. Right now, as we're recording this in early 2022, we're seeing the great resignation. People are leaving work and people are saying, I don't want to be in the office five days a week. And I think we've established you don't have to be. Even pre-pandemic, I was running a team, we were in the office three days a week. So we don't need everyone there. I've run virtual, I've run remote, I've done lots of different types of work. You, Unless you're, you're working the assembly line, you don't need to be there. But when people say, I don't need to be there at all, this is a virtual company, you can operate that way for a while. We certainly have the past two years. But when you have a company in New York and you're on the beach in California, you can't just pop in for a couple hours one afternoon. And yes, you can do your work, but you start to lose subtle things. You don't get those water cooler conversations. You don't build those internal relationships. You don't go out to networking events and industry events that happen in the evenings after work. And so while in the short term, you can effectively execute, I think there are some long-term implications in terms of you're not going to advance your career as well. And we're gonna see this in a few years. I think people are gonna recognize you have to be within a driving distance. You have to be within a quick travel, I can come in for the day distance to a particular company you're working with. I think that's really interesting because um, 
what feedback I've had from people uh, uh, that I still speak to in their careers <clears throat> are that the juniors are actually suffering the most from uh, not having that touch points, regular touch points in the office, just water cooler or cup of coffee, just to have a conversation or, or even going up to someone's desk and just asking how they would approach certain things. So I think that's a really important thing that I think we all are underestimating. I think some companies are recognizing that, um, but I think it's something that we'll see in the next year or two where there will be a sort of backlash against total, and it depends on uh, like total remote working because it, it can work for software developers. They don't have to be in the same office. Well, actually software developers, it's a very collaborative type of work. They work with each other quite often. Mm -hmm. They work with their internal customers, whether it's the product managers or the accounting team because they need some functionality. But here again, I think all of us benefit from being together and learning, I'm going to say through osmosis, through that being near each other. So as you point out, as junior people especially start to suffer, there's some worry that if you let people have that flexibility, being remote where they kind of set their own hours a little. Yes, we're all working, let's call it 40 hours, but you can't tell is it really 39 versus 42 or when you give people flexibility, well, be in the office at least three days a week, but if you wanna do four, that's up to you. There's some concern that women who tend to be the primary caregivers, they're the ones who are, will only be in three days a week. They're the ones who are gonna stop at 40 hours while others do 42. And when we look ahead five, 10 years, we know there's already a problem. We don't have enough women rising to senior ranks. Well, now we're gonna exacerbate that problem because women are gonna be the ones who turn off earlier with this optional flexibility, whereas the men can say, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to work longer. And so that's going to be a problem for our DEI, especially in the leadership roles. I've spoken to a couple of people recently on my podcast who have talked about that you don't need to do 60 hour weeks and that you can be super efficient, super productive in 40 hours only. What's your experience as a as a CTO, as a leader, uh, that with it with that mindset to you need to be in the office twelve hours a day versus you can be super productive for seven or eight hours a day? We need to distinguish between productivity and duration because you can be there for twelve hours and spend half of it checking Facebook and talking to friends, and you're not productive. You could also be there for six hours and be inefficient because you're on Facebook and talking with others about non-work things. So it's how productive you are, how much time is, we'll say, wasted. Now, some of that is fine, both because after three hours of intense work, you, you need that break. You need the coffee break or you need to check social media or just do something to, to reset. Yeah. You also, in these conversations, when you walk over and you talk to your coworker about what she did this weekend... And that conversation, it's not work related, but then all of a sudden the conversation leads you to something mm -hmm. and that's part of work. And so that's okay. What that balance is, I don't know. Now, in terms of duration, certainly we see when people are starting to put in 50, 60 plus hour weeks, you start to get more mistakes made. You start to get problems. I've done it sometimes, certainly back in the nineties, we had that intensity to us back when I was in my twenties and could do a 60 hour week and said, yeah, I don't mind. We also know sometimes there might be a tight deadline. And if for two or three weeks you need to do it, you do it. I think people can push if yeah. that happens. You were in the big four, you obviously had a very hard deadline and everyone had to work up against it. And hours, it was, and there was an expectation of hours at, 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 at the big four, um, which I don't think was necessarily a positive thing for lots of people, but if you were willing to do that, there was a there was a perception. And I think that was what it was. It was more of a perception of being productive rather than necessarily being the most productive in the hours that I was in the office. And so I think when you do start having people for those long hours, more than a few weeks, productivity goes down. I typically run my teams somewhere around, I do startup companies. I say, look, this is not a 40 hour job it's going to be somewhere around 45 to 50 hours a week. Mm. That's what we're, we're aiming for. Some of the weeks will be closer to 50, some may be closer to 40, 
Mm. And, and that's the understanding. Awesome. Um, what do you see uh, your future for the next two to five years? What's the priority? For me, I am putting out a new app. So I have a companion app to my book and we're actually doing a universal version. This is going to help people better retain content from books, from podcasts, from classes, from other sources. It's going to help people better remember because you read a book and you go, this is great. And then you forget three weeks later. Mm -hmm. So we have a way to counter that. So that's a side project of mine. I'm going to continue doing startups and the fractional CTPO work. And then I also now, especially as COVID is starting to wane, it's not over. It'll probably be seasonal, but we're not where we were two years ago. Yeah. We're seeing events come back. And so I'll, I'll be doing a lot more speaking engagements with companies at conferences worldwide, going around talking about topics in the book or some of the other topics I speak on. Fantastic. Okay, we're coming to the end of the interview. I asked the same six questions to all of my guests. They're quick fire questions. They don't need a quick fire answer. Um, they've been told uh, that they are thought provoking is one of one of those uh, comments on. So the first question is, what was the best decision that you've made? These are definitely thought provoking questions because that's a good one. Best decision was probably to start ballroom dancing because that was a wonderful sport activity. I was a competitive ballroom dancer for many years. It took me all over the country. I had fun. I had great friends. And it helped me with some of my skill development. So I'm very glad I did ballroom dancing, especially competitively. Amazing. Uh, what's the best piece of advice you've been given? Nothing ventured, nothing gained, which is what my mother would tell me when growing up. Okay. Take chances, calculated chances, yeah. not just wild chances, but take risk. That's your engineer side of you coming through, isn't it? <laughs> Calculated. Yeah, very much so. Um, who helped you most in your career? my parents in that they taught me the value of education, the value of learning and thinking. And that's what served me well throughout my career. Do you have any regrets? Oh, so many regrets. Those typically are the chances not taken, the ones I should have. And early on, I was probably more timid than I should have been. It's really interesting you say that because um... Early on in my career, opportunities came across my came across uh, my desk, or, or but and I I was in 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 a way I was kind of paralyzed to actually take action. And someone wise said to me, "It's not necessarily the problem if you don't take opportunities; it's if you don't get opportunities. So you can defer them for a while if you're not in the right place to take every opportunity to come. But the problem is when." when you don't actually get the opportunities, when you are, if you're in a career and you've been sidelined or you've been moved aside because of whatever reason, that's when you need to be worried if you're not getting opportunities. One thing I've learned when you have the right mindset, opportunities come. There have been studies on luck and they would do this study where they say ahead of time, do you, are you a lucky person or not? People would fill it out. They'd give them a magazine a made up one and say, okay, you're going to go through this and you have to count the number of times this phrase is in the magazine. Mm -hmm. So everyone opens it up and they start reading through it. But somewhere, I want to say page three, there's an advertisement and the advertisement says, you can stop reading. The answer is 37. Just go tell the, the person running it. It's 37, collect your money and be done. Right. And so some people spot the ad and some don't. And obviously they finish faster. Yeah. And the people who describe themselves as lucky are statistically more significant or, or more significantly, it, it is a, it's a real statistical analysis. It's not just, yeah, kind of, it's statistically relevant that they find this faster, they complete it faster. So luck, having the mindset of luck seems to generate luck in some way. And I think now I'm not a big metaphysical, I believe the universe I'm a scientist, but when we have that framework in our head of, I can see opportunities, then opportunities that someone else says, why well, I, I don't get lucky or no one ever comes to help me out. I don't meet interesting people. Mm -hmm. So people walk by and say, oh, I'm sure he's not interesting or I'm sure she's not interested in me. But when you say, I'll bet these people are fascinating or I'll bet opportunities coming my way, you're more likely to see them. 
So I think that mindset of, I can see opportunities, I will have opportunities, leads to opportunities. Absolutely. And mindset is fundamentally important, whatever business or career that you're in. Um, as you say, if you're in the right mindset to see the opportunities, you will act upon them, more likely to act upon them than people who maybe, as you said, more timid or, or not as confident. Um, next question. What are you most proud of? That I've been able to help so many people through the teaching I've done at MIT and elsewhere, through the nonprofits I've worked with, just having that impact on both individuals and the world. That's what I'm most proud of. Excellent. And what does legacy mean to you? It means for me, having a family who I love and I'm proud of, having an impact in my industry and successful career, and having that larger impact on the world. And lastly, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. And there you can see where to buy my book, Amazon and other places. You can get in touch with me or follow me on social media. You can see more of my writing or download the free app that I mentioned. It's available from the Apple and Android stores. And that's linked from the website. And then the resources page where there's a number of free downloads. And I list as well other books I recommend, including the ones on negotiation and other topics. So all of this is available at thecareertoolkitbook.com. I will definitely check that out after this interview. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you so much for your, uh, for your conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And you've given me great insight into engineering tech business. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.